to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ return to me says the lord of hosts and i will return to you says the lord of hosts zechariah chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 we find the powerful message of god's urgency in appealing to the people come back to me welcome to our study of the minor prophets today we look at the final two minor prophets zechariah and malachi of course the gospel of christ program is brought to you by members of the church of christ those members of the church of christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit with them. If you're joining us today and you have access to the internet, we encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a host of free Bible study material. You can access our audio and video lessons there, and you can even request, free of charge, we'll even pay the shipping, CDs and DVDs that can be sent to you to encourage and help you in your Bible study. And as always, if you've got a Bible question or you want to study the Bible further, our contact information will be given at the end of the lesson. We encourage you, write to us or call us. We want to help you in any way we can spiritually. The book of Zechariah is probably, although it's a larger book with more chapters than many, it's probably one of the most misunderstood and least known books in the Minor Prophets. And one of the reasons being is Zechariah points so much, so far ahead in its prophecy that sometimes we miss out on those great prophecies. And so for just the initial start of our lesson, we want to think about it and show the practicality of this book by looking at some of the prophecies of the Christ, of the Messiah, found in the book of Zechariah. Let's begin with Zechariah chapter 3, verse number 8. Notice this powerful prophecy about Jesus. The scripture says, Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. What is this branch? Mentioned again in Zechariah 6, verse 12. We're, we're living in a time when the Old Testament age is about to come to a close. Not many more years ahead, and, and that system will be no more. Who's this branch? What all's going on here? Well, when you think of a branch... You think of something coming up out of a tree or maybe something coming up out of a root system that looked like it was about dead. That's the idea. Isaiah 11 verse 1 I think goes hand in hand with Zechariah chapter 3 verse 8. Here's what it says. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. Now watch this. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. Jeremiah 33, verse 15, In those days and at that time I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. Who is this branch coming out of Jesse? Revelation 5, verse 5 tells us that Jesus is both the root and the offspring, the branch of Jesse. Luke chapter 1, verse 32 and 33, He's the one born of Mary who would have that eternal kingdom. And so as I think about Zechariah, as I see these promises and prophecies of, of hope and a future, all of that is dependent upon Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, prophesied in this book. Now, look at another, for example, prophecy with me about Jesus that would be found in the book of Zechariah. I want you to notice Zechariah chapter 6, verse number 13. The scripture says, Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord, again speaking of the branch, he shall bear the glory, he shall sit and rule on his throne, so he shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace 
shall be between them both. Jesus is here seen as, as both reigning on the throne and as priest. Well, who is this? Wonderful, counselor, mighty God, prince of peace. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, he's going to build the temple of the Lord. What is that temple of the Lord? 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15 says, The house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. It's the church. Jesus promised in Mark 9 verse 1, Assuredly, I say to you, standing here today, that some of you will not taste death until you see the kingdom present with power. Jesus said, I will build my church. As the Prince of Peace, whom the angels sang when He came onto the earth, peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Surely, this prophecy points us toward Jesus Christ, listen now, who is able to give peace that passes all understanding. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Thank God that we have these prophecies, we see their fulfillment, and we know the great blessings of following Christ. Let's turn to another definitive prophecy that is even alluded to in the New Testament. Look at Zechariah chapter 9, verse number 9. Here's a wonderful prophecy about Jesus. The Bible says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, your King is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. What in the world is this talking about? Here comes a king. He's lowly. Wait a minute. Kings aren't lowly. Riding on a, a donkey. A donkey. Not a white stallion. Even a colt. A foal of a donkey. What kind of king is this they were thinking? And yet in Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 10, in that what we refer to as triumphal entry, Jesus rides that foal of the donkey into Jerusalem. They lay down palm reeds. They, they sing out Hosanna in the highest. And fulfillment is seen here. Jesus being brought in as truly the great King. Revelation affirms this in Revelation 19 verse 16. As the praise from heaven is given, He is King of all kings and Lord of all lords. The King who's now seated at the right hand of the throne on high. Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 4. Look, look again at this great prophecy. Hundreds of years before, a, a foal of a donkey he's going to ride in on? You know, the Jews never would have thought it that way. They wouldn't think of their Messiah, their king, coming in on a, a lowly donkey. They want him riding in on a white stallion with pomp and power and prestige. And yet, just as the Scripture prophesied, so it was true. Jesus truly came in as the great king. Now, one of the most interesting, because of the minuteness of the detail concerning the prophecies of Jesus, is found in Zechariah chapter 11. I want you to look at this text with me for just a moment. Look at Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. The Scripture records, Then I said to them, If it is agreeable to you, give me my wages, and if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, that princely price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw it into the house of the Lord for the potter. What's going on here? Well, you remember very well. Matthew chapter 27, verses 3 through 10. They enlist Judas to betray Jesus. Whoever he is, we want you to go up to him, place a kiss on him, and when you do that, we're going to take him, we're going to bind him, you're going to get 30 pieces of silver. After those events transpired, we find that Judas got those 30 pieces of silver, but boy did he feel guilty about it. So guilty that he tried to give it back. They wouldn't take it because it was blood money, it was against their tradition. What did he do with that? He took those 30 pieces of silver, cast it back in the temple, and they bought a field called the potter's field. Look at all the minuteness of the detail here. 30 pieces of silver? Why not 29? Why not 31? How did Zechariah know that? That it was going to be 
cast back, that it was going to buy a potter's field. Had it all. Do you see the power of God in prophecy? Look at Jesus and the things that surround the cross and how this would be completely fulfilled in every way, showing, truly showing that He is the Messiah, the Son of God, and illustrating His power. Now, one last prophecy that we want to notice is Zechariah chapter 12, verses 8 and 9. The Scripture says, In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day shall be like David, and the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. It shall be in that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. What do we know about this great one to come? He's going to be like David. Luke 1, verse 32 and 33. He's of the house of David. He's the root and offspring of David. Revelation 5, verse 5. He's reigning now on the throne of David, just as was prophesied to David. 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 through 14. One of your seed is going to reign on the house of God forever. My friends, that's Christ. And so what do I learn from the book of Zechariah about Jesus? The multiple prophecies show me that He truly is the Son of God and that He is now reigning on high. I want you to also notice chapter 12, verse number 10. Look at what they did. It's prophesied they would do to Jesus. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. They Watch this now. They will look on him whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves a firstborn. They'll look on him whom they've pierced. John 19, 37, they pierced the hands and the feet of Jesus, just as was prophesied in Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53, here in Zechariah 12, verse 10. How did they know they were going to prophesy? Friend, Zechariah didn't write this from a post. No, he wrote this years ahead, knowing exactly what would happen. Now, we cannot overlook this one other passage. It's so important as it relates to prophecies about the Messiah. Look at Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1. And I want you to notice, following the prophecies, they've pierced His hands, they've pierced Him. What's going to happen next? Look in Zechariah 13, 1. In that day, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanliness. In that day, what, what are we talking about? When Jesus was pierced, a fountain was open for sin and uncleanliness? Do you remember John 19, 34? They pierced the side of Jesus, and what happened? Forthwith came blood and water. And Jesus, as He instituted the Lord's Supper at the Passover, said in Matthew 26, 28, when He came to that fruit of the vine, He said, This is My blood of the new covenant shed for many for." their forgiveness of sins. I mean, you've got multiple other passages that time won't permit us to look at. Zechariah 13, 6, you've got wounds in his hands by his friends. Zechariah 13, 7, you've got him being rejected uh, by the, the sheep, the shepherd that was rejected. He's seen as fellow Jehovah. I mean, there's so many pra prophecies that clearly show Jesus as the Son of God. Now, Along these same lines, we want to mention just a couple of practical lessons in the book of Zechariah. And one is this. Zechariah chapter 2, verse 4. God says, run, tell it to the young man. There's an urgency in the message of the gospel, is there not? Mark 16, 15, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Now, a lot of information we're not going to have time to look at, but there's a practical lesson as it relates to a popular demonic doctrine that I want you to see in the book of Zechariah. Did you know that prophecy taught that unclean spirits, demon possession, and the host of things that are so popular today that that would end and that it would no longer exist for us today. Look at Zechariah chapter 13, verse number 2 with me. Remember now, Zechariah 13, 1. 
the fountain's open. Jesus' blood is spilled or shed, freely given, and cleansing's taken place. We know that happens on the cross, the preaching of it in Acts chapter 2, and so the time frame is the New Testament. What else is going to happen during that time frame? Look at Zechariah 13 too. It shall be in that day, same time frame, says the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of idols from the lands. Israel no longer worshiped idols. They shall no longer be remembered. Now watch this. I'll also cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to depart from the land. We're not living in the day of prophecy today. We have God's final message, Jude 3. But you know what else is amazing? God says in that day, Unclean spirits are going to depart from the land. Jesus cast them out. His apostles cast them out. They had that power. They did what the prophets said. But friend, we're not living in the day and age where I have to worry about demon possession. I'm not living in a day and age where that exists. That was a New Testament phenomenon to show the power of Christ over Satan in casting out those demons, and it's something that ceased in the first century just as prophecy taught that it would. Now we come to that final book in the Old Testament, Malachi. After Malachi is written, there will be a dearth of revelation for about 400 years. God's people are now getting that last word from the Almighty in this book, and it is a book of love and yet a book of rebuke. God says 12 times, you say, now you contrast that with what God says, Thus saith the Lord. Key verse and key thought, Malachi chapter 1 verse 2, God has loved and He still does love Israel in spite of her sins. It's a, it's a plea of love to Israel to trust God, to put their hope in Him, and to not turn back to their sinful ways as they often had throughout the days of Israel. Let's think about some of the practical messages. I want you to look in Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 with me, as God makes that appeal out of love to Israel. Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, God says, I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, In what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob have I loved, but Esau I have hated and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. Now, are we really talking about Jacob and Esau? Jacob represents Israel. Esau represents the ungodly nations who became the Edomites and later the Idumeans and the Herods came from. But the point is this. Jacob followed me. Israel's trying to follow me. I've loved Israel. I've shown that. I've destroyed their enemies. That's proof positive that I love Israel as I say. God did that by defeating their enemies and showing His power. Friend, we can truly know today, just as Israel did, that God loves us. You say, how? Here's how. God so loved He gave. What do you mean He gave? Gave His only begotten Son for the sins of the world. John 3.16 Not only did that conquer our enemies, Hebrews 2 verse 14, that also made the pathway to heaven clear through Jesus Christ our Lord. God now is going to show them that although He's loved Israel, they have actually despised God's name and are giving God the leftovers. Look at Malachi chapter 1, beginning in verse number 6. The Bible says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I'm the father, where's my honor? And if I'm a master, where's my reverence, says the Lord of hosts, to you priests who despise my name? Yet you say, God says you despise my name, you say, in what way have we despised your name? You offer defiled food on my altar, but you say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? When you offer lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? God says, you despise me. You hate me in essence. And they say, despise you? How have we despised you in that you offer me the leftovers? You're given the lame, the sick, and the blind to that which ought to be first in your life? God says, now let's make it practical. You take that lame animal, you take that sick animal, give it to the governor. Here's an old animal that can't walk. All its legs are crippled. 
You give that to the governor and would he say, boy, what a gift? No. You give that blind cow to your governor and he say, boy, thank you, that's really going to help a lot. No, he'd be insulted and you know he would. That's God's point. You're giving me the leftovers and you think I'm okay with it. What does it show? It shows the place God had in their life. What was God worth to them, the leftovers? What's God worth to us? Are we really giving, now think about it practically. Are we really giving God the best of our time, of our effort, of our love, of our finances, of our family, of our jobs, of our mission in life? Or are we giving that to somebody else who really ought not to be first in our life and not giving God the glory that He deserves in so many ways. Now, another lesson that we learn about God from the book of Malachi is that God hates divorce. God tells the people, you're dealing falsely with one another. They say, well, how are we dealing falsely? Look at how God answers that in Malachi chapter 2. I want you to notice what the scripture says beginning in verse 14. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion, and your wife by covenant. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. Now here's the background. For the Lord God of Israel says, He hates divorce. Why? It covers one's garments with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore... Take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. There was a problem in Israel and it was a huge problem. It was injustice to mankind and, and it was in the marriage relationship. Men were not dealing properly with their wives. Context and background seems to be that if they got tired of a wife, they could just cast it off and get another one. And God says, no, that's not right. Why is it not right? Because God's looking for godly offspring and that's a violent act that God hates. Friend, hear it well today from the Scripture. Malachi chapter 2, verse 16 clearly says, God hates divorce. Genesis 2, 24 tells us why. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Why does God hate divorce? Because it's not in His plan. It's not according to His will. And it is a destroying of the foundation of the home. Someone says, well, the, the spark isn't what it used to be. Wait, wait a minute now. That's not a reason to deal treacherously with, some, to treacher, treacherously with someone and divorce them. That doesn't give you the right to say, well, I can just cast it off and get a new one, just like a new toy or a new car. No, God still hates divorce. And Matthew 19, 9 clearly says, the only scriptural reason for divorce is fornication. And then, my friend, only the innocent party has the right to divorce and remarry. It is not according to the will of God. Why? Mainly because of the nature of God, which does not change all the way from Genesis 2. Look in your Bible in Malachi chapter 3 for just a moment. I want you to notice what the Scripture says in Malachi chapter 3, verse number 6. God says, For I am the Lord, I do not change, therefore you are consumed O oh, Israel. What do we know about God's character, His nature, His person? Friend, this is so encouraging. God does not change. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, in the future forever. God's not going to lie or cheat or steal. Hebrews 6 verse 18, it's impossible for God to lie. God who cannot lie. Titus 1 verse 2 is our hope and our joy and our trust. And so when I think about God and His character, I realize how much I need God, His strength and His help in this life and how I need to make sure that I put my trust in the things that God wants me to put my trust and my hope in in each and every way and in every day that God wants me to really be what He's made me. Now, let's close by noting a few practical passages also from Malachi about the Messiah. I want you to look in Malachi chapter 3, verse number 1. The Scripture says in this great messianic passage, Behold, I will send my messenger. He will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly 
come to his temple. Who, who is that messenger? Well, we learn from Luke and from Matthew and John that that's Jesus Christ. And it was John who said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Suddenly, John 1, who take, verse 29, who takes away the sins of the world. But the one that's probably the most memorable from the book of Malachi. Notice Malachi chapter 4. I want you to look in verses 4 through 6. Look at these closing words in the Old Testament. The Scripture says, Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet, well, for the coming of that great and dreadful day of the Lord, watch this now, He'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. It's a messianic prophecy, even though it's speaking about John the Immerser. Luke chapter 1, verse 17, uh, Matthew 11, verse 14, clearly identifies this is prophecy about John. What's he going to do? He's going to prepare the way, and here's how it's messianic. He's going to prepare the way for the Messiah. What did John do? John didn't come preaching himself. John came preaching, Behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Here's the Messiah, John would say. John 1 verse 29, He came preparing the way of the Lord, whom John didn't even feel like he was worthy to loose down the strap of his sandals. And yet Jesus said, what a great man John was in that he did that. Friend, what do we know as the Old Testament comes to a close? There's a man coming who's going to prepare the way for the Messiah. That Messiah is coming and he's going to save Israel. Who is that? Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And so we ask you today, have you submitted your life? to the Messiah, whom we've heard so many prophecies about today. Have you heard His message? If so, do you believe that message? Are you willing to change your life based on that message? Would you be immersed in water to become a part of His kingdom? Acts 2 verse 38. And if you've done all that, are you living faithfully every day to the Messiah so that one day you can hear those words, Well done, good and faithful servant. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.